This one. Okay, so good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. So I hope you survived the social event from yesterday. I think that there was much more people than is presented today, so hope they will arrive. Okay, I have two uh, announcements, uh, or three. Uh, first of all, please don't forget to uh, post your feedbacks and votes for each session that you will be presented today. Uh, second one, the talks from C228 has been moved to uh, room E104 because of the space. And the most important thing, uh, today we have the, the final session where you can uh, win some prize. So stay here, do not leave and be there so you can win something. Okay, so today we are starting with the first session. The title of this session is Co uh, Containers, a Brief History of uh, Nearly Everything. This talk will be about all of the cool stuff that happens in containers, as well as how Red Hat is responding to it. Talk is presented by Mike McGrath, sorry? Mike McGrath. <laughs> just, just. Okay, so they will present it themselves. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. Uh, Daniel J. Walsh and Stephen Posty. Yeah? Oh, thank you. <laughs> All right. So, uh, hi everybody, day three, we made it. I guess last night had, I'm gonna say, around a 50% mortality rate. So they, they did okay, that's fine. So uh, my name is Mike McGrath, I'm a managing architect at Red Hat on the Atomic OpenShift stuff. It's basically our container initiative. And uh, I guess I'll, I'll hand this over to, uh, uh, Steve can talk on his own, I hand to Dan. Cool. Oh, should I say, all right, I'm Steve. I'm Dan. They also work at Red Hat for, oh, for now. <coughs> okay. okay, so we've got a bunch of stuff we're going to talk about today, but before we get into what is going on right now in the, the current realm of containers, I have a brief history of what is going on and where some of this container technology came from. I was able to trace it back to 1963. Uh, if you can believe that. And uh, we'll talk about everything from zones to VMs uh, to platform as a service. And then we'll get into a lot of the stuff that has happened really just in the last couple of years uh, that engineers like Dan have been leading. Uh, and we'll get into some of the orchestration needs uh, that have happened that also have allowed developers to figure out how these things work. Uh, and then we'll hand it off to Steve for that. So, in the beginning. Virtual machines. Uh, were kind of a pre-container technology, and some virtual machine concepts uh, go back to about 1963-ish. Uh, if you can believe that, uh, they had uh, the, the M44, uh, 44X uh, had some partial virtualization, but I was actually surprised to see 
that the S360 had a full hardware uh, emulator built into it. Uh, that, as far as I could tell, actually worked. And uh, uh, the CP40s, I don't even know what the CP40s were. Anybody know? Any hands up? It's a bit before our time. Uh, they had some sort of, they had the, the early beginnings of uh, what eventually became hypervisors uh, that made uh, actual virtualization possible, which I think is pretty neat. And so uh, I've got several flashbacks in the beginning here. Uh, these are some other things that were going on in 1963. First up is ASCII was founded, same year, which is nice, yeah. Panda, yeah, way to go. The 256 character table that could. And also, and I don't know if we have any decks in the uh, uh, deck, uh, deck, or I guess we do, Dan, you worked the deck. We have deck tape, uh, which was introduced in 1963. So just a, a quick guess, if anybody can guess, we'll see. How much storage could the deck tape actually hold? And I'll give you a quick quote. I actually found a news article from the time. Uh, and it said, quote, it's considered a major improvement over the hand-loaded paper tapes which I, I, I couldn't find any pictures, but uh, who, who wants to take a guess at how much storage these things could have? One megabyte? Oh, Lord, no. Too high, too high. Depending on, you're well, you getting closer, yes. Depending on the word size you use, between 144 and 184K. And uh, these things were great because they behaved like actual drives. You could treat them like a really slow drive and it would just seek out until the thing caught on fire or something, I don't know. <coughs> that could be a very early Twitter. One tweet per tape. Yep. <laughs> okay. So next up in the scene, we jump. You know, there's kind of a, a dead zone of container technology between 63 and the 70s. Uh, but right at the end of 1973, truths were invented. And uh, as as someone who has used truths in the past quite a bit, they're they're pretty fun. I like them. Uh, they're not a great security mechanism. I know that they kind of get sold that way a lot. But uh, I have been assured by top minds. It's not a great idea to use them as your first line of defense for security. And believe it or not, they're still in use today. Uh, if you're using a Fedora system, and probably also the rail systems, I'm assuming at this point, uh, every single one of those RPMs was built through Mach, which uses Cheroots on the back end to spit that RPM out to build and, and, and produce it. So believe it or not, uh, it's still very actively being used and in the critical path. Although I have also been told that Mach now has the ability to use something other than uh, Cheroots, I guess probably containers or something. Inspawn, uses Inspawn. However, that is not enabled yet in our actual build system, so hopefully that'll, that'll come on soon. Uh, Truths allows you to have different operating systems, different distributions that share the same kernel. Uh, that's how, for example, in the Fedora build system again, you can build uh, RPMs for Fedora 24, 25, or Rawhide, or RHEL, all in the same system. Uh, and that sounds very familiar to those of us using uh, container technologies today. Uh, but they're like containers, but they're kind of fake. So what else is going on in 1979, you're wondering? Well, this was, a, this was a top hit. This is the number one hit of 1979. I'm playing it. Let's see if we can hear it. I'll let it run for a little bit. Because it's good. Now, I want, to, I, want, I want you to pay attention to the swagger here. That's some swagger. Okay, so some of you in the audience are probably thinking, wait a minute, that's probably the first time I've heard that song, and, and also, that's not the top hit in Brno in 1979. Well, boy, do I have a treat for you. <laughs> oh, yeah. 1979, top hip. Is, is Jerry Korn? Is that the, am I pronouncing that right? Jerry Korn? So I'm just saying, the neck has nothing on this guy. Watch this. <laughs> This song is fantastic. <laughs> I'm gonna at least let him sing. I love it. All right. No, I'm, I'm going. 
So I also have some computing updates <laughs> from 79. Atari introduced the, the, the Model 400 800 computers. I noticed that the, the picture that came with this is, I guess that's partially Swedish and partially English. I don't really even know. What is it? German. It's straight German? Okay, German. It's German, but it also says Atari Personal Computer System, which I suspect is a little bit not German. But the, 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 small, the small words are German. Also, the Stanford cart. So who had ever heard of the Stanford cart? I'd never heard of this. Uh, it was a cart that was created actually in the 60s, and in 1979, ex this is what the, the, the words from, uh, from this website found, it successfully crossed a room on its own while navigating around a chair placed as an obstacle. That doesn't sound that great. That is not that impressive. However, I did a little bit more research, and there's video on this and stuff too. What actually happened was it successfully crossed a chair-filled room without any human intervention. However, it took five hours to do so. <laughs> it did, it took, and I'm not making that, it took five hours to do that. What is five hours to a robot? <clears throat> well, depending on the battery, that could be two lifetimes, I don't know. <laughs> it, it might have been, yeah. So now we flash forward a bit to 2004, and we're gonna jump around in the years here. But Solaris zones were a pretty interesting thing that, that, that some might argue were ahead of its time. Uh, oh, I have the, the wrong, wrong bullet points there. But, uh, so zones were shipped in Solaris, and that, that was actually pretty interesting to those of us in the, in the uh, uh, Linux land. But we didn't really have a good uh, equivalent of that yet. And so, uh, big things in 2004, World of Warcraft ships. I don't know if we have any WoW fans. I know Steve likes it. Then you, you remember this. And then, uh, so th that's kind of it for some of the pre-container stuff that's going on. And I know, Steve, you, you have, some, you have some, some opinions about virtual machines. I know you want, yeah. you want to chat about the VMs real quick? Go, do some VM talk. Is that okay? Can you hear yourself? You're good. Now? How about now? How about now? Yeah. 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 Okay. So, um, so for virtual machines, I actually think they don't get enough credit in container world. Uh, and the reason why is, uh, how many of you are actually active developers? Sysadmins, it doesn't count because you actually just had to deal with our bullshit. But how many of you are actually like web developers back around 2000, 2004 time frame, right? And so for you, when you needed to build an app, what did you want? Like if you needed to build a real app, you wanted a server. You didn't want anything else like, ooh, I've got my own server. You would go down to the sysadmins and like, no, I'm building a new app and I need my own server. And my app is awesome. So I need my own server and my own database server, and my database server also has to have one, one terabyte of attached SCSI backplane, and I also need redundant power supplies and dual CPU. I'm high availability, right? And so that's what we all thought we needed. And I think that was, and the reason I have the pacifier here is because I think that's how us developers felt about servers. Like, how many of you have kids or no kids that have had pacifiers? And how do they get when their, we call it binky, is taken away? Yeah, we all start crying and things are bad. And I think what actually virtualization did when we got to virtual machines, the, does anybody recognize that, well, the quote's used a lot. Did anybody see the Tom Cruise movie, um, Rin, is it like Live, Die, Repeat? Is that the final name that they came out with? Did you guys see Live, Die, Repeat? It's where he's stuck in a time loop? I did not see that movie. What, Edge of Tomorrow? Yeah, the American name, I think, was called Edge of Tomorrow, but then I think it came back out as Live, Die, Repeat. Did anybody see that? There was these aliens that attacked, and they kept looping time. It felt like he was stuck, like, in a video game, basically. But the whole point of it is, in one point, there's this dr drill sergeant who comes in. Good morning, Alpha Company. You're going to be the tip of the spear, the edge of the knife for the attack coming in. And so I think what VMs were was the tip of the spear to break our dependence on binkies, right? <laughs> So what, it, what VMs allowed is developers, when they started getting better, because I remember when VMs first came out, I was like, I don't want a virtual machine. I need my own box. I'm special and a snowflake. And I think once VMs got big enough and sysadmins kind of forced us to use them, we broke from having to have a physical machine. And so once there was that psychological break from I need my own machine, it enabled a whole bunch of other things to happen. Yeah, so we're kind of back in 1999 here when uh, VMware sort of repopularized it. And those first editions of VMware, I, you know, I used some of those. They were not that great, uh, but they did a fine job, and they inspired our fellow developers, which, uh, which is good. Uh, also in 1999, the uh, microdrive. These things were like uh, four centimeters uh, big. 
Uh, they, I think I saw by the end of it, uh, they were up to about uh, eight gigabytes large. Oh, and by the way, for those of you that don't speak uh, metrics, that's about an inch and a half for the, the Americans in here. It's an inch and a half. So, uh, but these, these got taken over by uh, flash drives and compact flash and things because, the, you know, these little micro drives, are, they're, they're not very big, uh, but they're, they had a lot of moving parts, and so they could not survive even like tiny falls through space onto hard surfaces. Uh, so they... Yeah. Was it would auto park the it would park, yeah. If it detected a certain number of G's in your laptop. So sometimes you'd be sitting there and you'd jerk a little bit and you'd hear it click. Yeah. You know, oh, it parked. Okay, so now we're starting to get into some, uh, you know, now we're going to jump forward back again to kind of the mid 2000s or the late 2000s. And uh, we start seeing some actual really interesting innovation where people are taking some of these components, putting them together in actual usable. Uh, format and I'm giving the, uh, the the award here to Heroku, founded in uh, 2007. Very popular among uh, developers. And I guess I know Steve, you've used Heroku before. Wh when did you I, no, see I use it for? Ah, oh, okay, okay, I didn't use it. I that's fine. The binky, yes. So, uh, but it never it hasn't it never really took off as the standard. It's still you know in use, uh, but it's not like it had that uh, first mover runaway success stuff. So uh, that's, uh, uh, but there are other things going on in 2007, as you might know. Uh, one of which, worth mentioning, is uh, the Kindle got released. So I, you know, people like the Kindle. I'm a huge fan of the Kindle. But also, interestingly, the same year the Kindle launched, the iPhone launched. That was the, the first release of the iPhone. So that was a pretty good year for computing. And I mention that because we've only got some pretty slim pickings from here on out. There's not, not a lot of great, like, mind-bending uh, announcements coming. So uh, PaaS was uh, 2008, which was interesting. So Dot .cloud was founded, and we'll get into Dot .cloud a bit more. Uh, but .com formally shut down in 2006, so uh, 16, about uh, a year ago. And around this time was when LXC got put together. So this, is, again, is some of that combination of individual parts into an actual uh, usable thing. And so you know, Red Hat had worked a lot on uh, some of the kernel features and namespacing. Uh, that went into this, and LXC and those namespacing, putting all that stuff together is what makes uh, containers possible. And as uh, someone that was working uh, with some of these things in 2008, a lot of people were trying to figure out how to put these things together into an actual usable solution. And so uh, 2008, uh, other things that, that happened, uh, the MacBook Air was released. Like, okay, that's great. I, you know, I don't know about revolutionary. Uh, but also, and this is a, a great quote from Larry Ellison. I had to go back and dig this. Uh, from, from Open World. He actually said this in front of a whole bunch of people. Uh, we'll make cloud computing announcements. I'm not going to fight this thing, but I do not understand what we would do differently in the light of cloud computing. And I can tell you, I completely agree with Mr. Elson. He does not understand what he would do differently <laughs> in light of cloud computing. <clears throat> Okay, so this is when I got into the mix. Uh, OpenShift launched in uh, 2011. Uh, this was, uh, we, we, you know, we shipped with online and uh, on-premise versions. It's very near and dear to my heart. Dan and I worked, worked hard in some of those uh, very early days. And uh, this was interesting for me and for Red Hat in a couple different ways. One is that it was the first attempt of Red Hat of becoming some sort of hosting provider. You can actually go through and there was an online version. Uh, and then we had the uh, uh, on-premise version that customers could use. Uh, which was great. And so that was uh, 2011. It feels like yesterday, but quite a while ago at this point. Also in 2011, the Nest. I don't know how many of you have a Nest. I like my Nest. Uh, so that came out that, uh, at the same time. Okay, so now we're starting to get into some interesting, uh, some very interesting times. First, let's talk about gears. So uh, at Red Hat, at least, gears were a precursor to uh, container technology. And it was this combination of the gear, which was the containment, uh, and sort of base uh, file system view of, uh, of how things should be laid out. And then we added cartridges to the gear to give it uh, whether or not it would run PHP or Perl or something else. <coughs> we did have minimal use of namespaces, mostly in uh, f the file system namespace. Everybody had their own slash temp, things like that. Uh, and to me, one of the more interesting things with this is that it was done with uh, SE links, a separation between any individual gear uh, and the file system was done with SE Linux. And one little side note on this, the difference between, uh, for example, running a PS inside of a gear and running a PS inside of a container is uh, they, they might look the same. You might only see your processes. You wouldn't see other people's processes. 
you wouldn't see the system processes. Uh, but if you ran a S trace on, so for example, a PS, did you ever do this, Dan? Have you ever seen this? Have you? No. So what it does is it'll go through and SC Linux will deny you access to all the uh, proc file system that it shouldn't have access to. And so PS silently ignores it. And so they look very similar, but in a true namespace, none of that stuff even exists to get denied. And so there, it's, you know, it's, it's much higher, uh, uh, higher level of security there. Uh, it never really caught on outside of Red Hat, uh, and it's comp it was kind of complicated to use and build uh, these cartridges and containers. You kind of had, had to have some fairly expert level knowledge to put these things together. Uh, but also around that time is when uh, Dot Cloud realized that it's Docker uh, technology. So Dot Cloud had some uh, some very early editions of Docker in their technology, uh, and uh, they had launched the Docker stuff back in uh, 2013. This is this is you know what popularity looks like. You can see very early on it was already popular than sliced bread, and uh, that popularity continues to grow now. <coughs> and so in March is when they shipped Docker. Uh, Red Hat actually got involved in, Mar uh, in uh, Docker commits somewhere around September uh, 2013. This was the earliest commit that I could find uh, from Alex Larson. I'm sure there may be others that I couldn't find, uh, but I did find this. And as it turns out, Dan here uh, was getting started uh, in March of the following year, around March in 2014. So who wants to take a guess back in 2014 what Dan might have been working on with Docker? Anybody? Bingo, SE Linux. It's his first commit. And it was a big one. That was, that was, uh, that took gumption, 700 editions. Yep. How long did it take to get merged? That one went into a few weeks after that. <laughs> <laughs> it went right in. Okay. That's good. That's good. Okay. So now we're getting into some of the modern times. I guess I'll pass some of this off to, uh, to Dan to go in, like all the different now container technologies, where they came from, what we're doing, all that stuff. Okay. So, uh, about this, uh, 2015 was this? Yes. Do we have a date up there? 2014. Um, so, obviously, everybody started getting into the Docker uh, bandwagon, and um, uh, but uh, CoreOS basically decided that you know they had some different ideas, and, and and working with Docker was a little bit difficult. So they did actually decided to come up with their own platform. They came up with Rocket, and it sort of uh, really sort of launched the whole OCI effort because, you know, all with containers, our biggest fear has always been that we'll end up with, you know, app, um, you know RPM and, and, and Debian, you know, two formats. And so really, Rocket sort of spurred the uh, creation of the OCI uh, effort and, um, you know, so it was fairly successful for that. Um, So basically, it's a standard standards for running containers and standards for packaging containers at this point. Um, so Rocket was was ki critical to that. Um, and as we announced uh, about, well, we were forced to announce because uh, the press found out about it uh, about three months ago. We've been, uh, announced OCID, and what we really wanted is rather than having one company dominate um, uh, the way containers are run, especially under Kubernetes. Uh, we decided to try to really do an open project, um, and that's where OCID came along. And as you see, uh, we're in desperate need of a logo. Although I think maybe we'll maybe we'll just stick with that logo. You know, we need a logo. <laughs> um, but any, any suggestions uh, would be great. Uh, OCID came along and it sort of uh, uh, showed an alternative, an actual competitor to Docker underneath Kubernetes uh, because, you know, we decided to build a product that, that separated, you know, had able to pull container images, able to run container images using the same tools that Docker used, um, and able to um, um, store them on top of copy and write file systems. So when Docker saw that, they decided to open source a new project called Containerd that looks an awful lot like OCID. So we've actually been trying to contribute back to them and trying to work together um, on Containerd, but so far all of our patches have been uh, ignored. But Containerd now is um, basically, uh, well, Containerd originally showed up um, as a um, as a tool for running Swarm, Docker Swarm. So they really wanted uh, to get uh, a separate daemon. Uh, outside of, of Docker for that the Swarm daemon could talk to uh, when we built. So that was the original container D. Uh, that had no ability to pull images and no ability to uh, do copy on write. 
Um, but after OCID was released, Docker decided to move more and more functionality to it. So in the future, I think Docker is going to get a lot thinner and Container D is going to get a lot fatter. Um, uh, but we'll see what happens uh, going forward with Container D. Uh, as we announced this week, uh, also we're work working towards system containers, which are sort of containers that aren't orchestrated. Okay, these are these are the idea here is to have um, containers that just run locally, and really we're looking at container registries as being a new way to store software. So if you just want to run processes on your system, then system containers. And uh, Giuseppe here with his cool red hat is uh, in there. Well, maybe that'll be our logo. Uh, so a little a little. Uh, Quick, uh, everybody, th this is the way I describe orchestration. So the real war in containers now is, is around orchestration. Uh, there seems to be three contenders um, in the orchestration world. Um, there is uh, Docker Swarm, um, which uh, tends, people tend to call it easy use. Um, and then I often, I've never used Docker Swarm, but they say it's easy to use, and then I hear other people saying it's tough to do real complicated things with it. And, and so, you know, whether or not it can get b beyond just, oh, really demonstrates well and can be used uh, widely. Uh, Mesosphere, uh, ba about a year ago, every time I talked to customers, they were all big into Mesosphere. Uh, and Mesosphere um, uh, is supposedly has better scalability um, and it se seems to be tending towards short run containers. So like, sort of like batch processing, where you want to run a, a process, uh, you know, a, a huge job, thousands and thousands of machines, and have something that finishes quickly. Um, so that seems to be where their real strength is. And then Kubernetes, which um, c uh, clearly is winning at this point. So in, in, in there was a great article that came out last week that, that they went out and analyzed the amount of people on LinkedIn that are putting uh, uh, Kubernetes into their uh, uh, expertise. And it shows a huge spike in the amount of people doing that. So if you judge by what people are trying to do to get jobs, then Kubernetes um, is, is the clear winner. That's a <laughs> um, uh, but uh, I think Kubernetes is best for sort of the traditional workloads, you know, where you have two databases, three databases, four databases, um, you know, web front ends, or, you know, uh, so that type of application, long running applications that you want to have fault, to uh, fault tolerant. Um, I don't think it scales right now as well as Mesosphere. So I think that's sort of where, uh, so whether Kubernetes grows to be able to scale as well as, as Mesosphere, whether Docker Swarm uh, comes in, uh, I don't know. But that's, that's really where the war is right now. That's where all the competition, in my opinion, that's where the real competition is happening in the container world. Oh, you take over. All right, so I'm going to get on a soapbox here. This is, because we got the stage, I get to make these statements. So you're, you're stuck with listening to this part. How many people have heard of the analogy of cattle and pets in container land? This is the most I've ever heard it in any audience, but I didn't see all the hands go up, so I'm going to give the analogy again. And for the other 80% of you, if I get it wrong, as you can tell, I'm a very informal speaker, please interrupt me. I do not have a code of conduct for my talks. You can actually interrupt me. And actually, you can curse at me as long as it's not really personal. We'll do that. Thank you, Mike. Yep. Uh, so I thought you'd like that. Thank you, I do. Yep. Um, so for cattles and pets, the analogy, this is used for cloud computing versus VMs, and specifically containers versus VMs. So, and I always get this wrong when I say it. I have it right in my head, but it comes out wrong. Cattle is containers, and VMs, or machines, are pets. And the idea with this is when you have a pet, you love it, and you'll, well, I don't know if it's true. I've seen a lot of dogs. Are most of you from Czech, the Czech Republic? No? Well, most of you are from Europe, and I've seen a lot of dogs in Europe, and I feel like you're probably pretty similar to Americans in terms of your dogs or your pets, where you will spend insane amount of money to prolong your pet's life for an extra week, even though it's in terrible pain. You're like, no, no, I can't give it up. Here's some chemotherapy and radiation therapy so that you can last another week. I'm going to buy you the best food while this is happening. Spare no expense. My dog has to stay with me. Is that a good association for most of Europe as well? Yeah, about how you feel about your pets? Right. So your VMs are the same way, right? Your VM is running Oracle. It's running, um, it's running Salesforce. It's running something really big. No, not Salesforce, SAP. And so it's running something really big, and you care a lot about it, and it's got like three sysadmins per VM because that stuff can't go down, and you expect that to be up all the time. 
Got it? So you see where VMs and pets come together? You care very, you might name your VMs, right? Um, <laughs> precious, <laughs> bastard. Um, so the, uh, on the other side, though, is the, in this analogy, is containers are cattle. And so I don't mind the VM part analogy. This is where things go wrong. So I'm going to say what I think is really wrong, but know that I don't believe this. So containers are cattle because the idea is on a, a, a rancher, on a cattle farm, doesn't care about the individual cow, right? So the cow's out in the field, it breaks its leg, fine, I'm going to shoot it, and I'll just get another cow to replace it. Right? You don't actually name most of your cows. They're just basically irreplaceable, and they're, ex they're, they're replaceable and identical in your mind. Is that right for all the people who've heard the analogy for cattle and pets? OK, that analogy is both offensive and wrong. <laughs> OK, so that's why I want to actually get rid of it on two levels. We'll, we'll start with the offensive one, because that one I just can state straight up. There's about a billion people in the world who considered cows sacred animals, and to say that you're just going to put a bullet in its head and just move on and they're all exactly the same is straight up offensive. So I, would, I think, I don't know who originated with this analogy, but I'm guessing it's someone probably with my skin tone and probably in California, somewhere in the valley, who thinks they know everything about everything in the world <laughs> and how could they possibly offend anything that was so obvious. So on the offensive level, we should get rid of it for that reason alone. Okay, but by, I'm also an ecologist actually by training. So I'm actually a conservation biologist. I actually have a, you can call me, so you might be Mr. McGrath, but I'm Dr. Pusty. I actually have a, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, I actually have a PhD in ecology. And I, I actually worked as a conservation biologist for a while. And we would go out to ranches in California and talk to the ranchers to try to get them to like help us work on the plans. And I can assure you this, ranchers care very deeply about each and every single cow. They may not name them with like, this is Bob, and this is Sally, and this is Mary. But they actually have ID tags for every single cow. And if that cow gets sick, you can bet there's a large animal veterinarian that's going to be called out. And so they're going to spend a lot of money to make sure that cow makes it all the way to market. Right? This, they care very, <laughs> they may not care. It's a huge investment for them. And so they're not going to be like, oh, yeah, just shoot in the leg, and I'll leave it out here for the coyotes to chew on. Right? <laughs> Like, they actually care a lot about it, and they're tracking each cow, and they develop huge databases to actually manage their cows. So it's factually wrong. You cannot say that containers are like cows to ranchers. So let's go to what I think is actually a better analogy that I'd like to see everybody use. I was very happy when Kubernetes decided on stateful sets rather than pet sets. So I don't have to fight that battle. So containers are ants. And what do you have against ants? Nothing. I, th so this, I have absolutely nothing against ants. This is, a, but as a biologist, I would like this, the analogy to be actually factually correct. How many of you, I actually won't make you to raise your hands because I don't want to bring shame on anybody. How many of you have a accidentally stepped on an ant? <laughs> don't raise your hands. I didn't want to bring shame. That's bad karma. Okay. You, no shame? Okay. So when you accidentally stepped on that ant, or you didn't even accidentally, but you intentionally squished the ant on your sink, right, or somewhere in your house, how many of you actually saw any other ant care about that? A, a bunch more did show up. And then they carried the carcass back down to their, their thing, and then they digested that ant, right? And actually, every single, these types of ants in a colony, the majority of them are actually genetically sisters and exactly the same. And so when an ant comes across a large, ta like let's say there's a bunch of ants out, it finds a, a moth that it wants. Does everybody know what a moth is? OK. Or I can say a, a worm. And they want to bring it back to their nest. How do they actually handle that task if it's too heavy for them? Sorry? They bring a whole bunch of other ants. They cause a swarm. And so when we talk about containers, when there's a job that needs more, that ex exceeding one container, what are we supposed to do? Bring more to containers. This is, ants act exactly like containers. They don't care about each individual one. They can do the exact same, the, we make containers so that you spin up a new one and it can replace an old one and it hor they horizontally scale to finish a task. So what, have I convinced you that ants are a better analogy for containers? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And so now we're going to keep with biology. Let's go to what replaces VMs. Elephants. So I replace VMs. So the new analogy is it, ants and elephants.
So elephants actually put a ton of resources into each individual in the herd, right? You've seen this all, as everybody watched the nature shows about elephants, right? And like, they care a lot and each individual matters. There's the matriarch, then there's her, her daughters and then some of the cousins and the males have to leave and they have graveyards, right? So like if they come across a skull of another elephant, they'll actually take time at that elephant and more, the skull and mourn it. Like they care about each individual elephant and they put a ton of resources into each individual. And to me, that is a more biologically accurate indication of what a, how we think about VMs. They each have a role, like the matriarch could be a master in a database replication situation, right? She controls the herd, the master controls the cluster of the Postgres database. There's actual differentiation among members and that's usually what we do with VMs. So I would like you to stop saying cattle and pets. I would also like you to spread the word that we should say ants and elephants. It's not quite as catchy, but it's accurate and not offensive. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and not feel remorse either. I actually, I think VMware would like to actually step on containers at any time. Yeah. Just because you want to treat elephants like ants doesn't actually make it fill us. Oh, the question was, the question was, is it actually correct? Because in Rev or over, you can have a pool of VMs which I think act like ants. Is that right? Yeah. Just because you have no problems with shooting a herd of elephants and treating them like ants doesn't mean that's morally correct. So I am not going to, I am not going to excuse your morals. I guess we're grilling tonight. It sounds yeah. delicious. So now you kind of know where things are right now. We, uh, we talked about some of the very early days, and really all the interesting stuff has happened in just the last five years or so. And, but there are a couple of other little things that have come aboard. And I guess if we have time, we'll have uh, Steve and, uh, and, and Dan go into it. <coughs> Unikernels. It's a thing. It's, a, it's, a, it's an actual thing. I've seen it work. You guys want to do this? I'll let you go first. No, because the whole th cause you're a doubter. And I'm a positive person, and I don't want to leave them on a sad note. <laughs> Let's get ready to rumble! All right, Let's I'll go it. first. I'll go first. So I'm going to say, uh, first, I love and respect Dan, no matter how much I put him down in this talk, this part of the talk. <laughs> and second, I'm also spicing it up a bit just because we have an audience. Um, I, how many of you have heard of unikernels? So not everybody. So the uh, basic idea with a unikernel is, when you're writing your application, containers, right, you basically bring up a small version of the OS and then run your app inside of that. I know that's a huge simplification, but it's the basic idea. The basic idea with a unikernel is when you run your app, you, instead of sharing the kernel, you actually compile only that which you need in the kernel to run your app and all the dependencies it requires as well. Would you agree with that definition, Dan? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so the first thing I would like is to state our philosophical positions as I see them. Dan works on the kernel quite a bit. Telling you that you can compile special kernels as a developer is more, like me as a web app developer, is morally, I would guess, morally offensive to Dan. <laughs> because he has spent many years making the kernel his baby. Perhaps an elephant. <laughs> While to me, the kernel is an ant. I don't, as long as that kernel's doing what it's doing, I don't care how it's built, I just want to write my web app. So that might explain some of our philosophical differences. The other thing is, up until, I would say, where it was before the, right before KubeCon last year, there was another show I was at where I saw, have any of you heard of the Unik project? U-N-I-K, like two people, okay. The, so U the Unik project? Yeah. I'm not, not the castrated male from, uh, uh, not the castrated male from Game of Thrones. Did you leave in my slide of all the stuff? Oh, it's all there. Oh, it's an ugly slide, but I know what he's going to say, so I'd ha I had to bring evidence. We'll get to it in a second, or we can go to it now if you want. Okay, so that's Project Unic, um, with a ton of stuff, because I know where Dan's going. He's going to say, I can't see a Python developer actually making a unikernel. You can't steal my lines, please. Sorry. 
<laughs> the, see, we, we pre-debated it. I kind of have an unfair advantage over... Uh, I get more stuff. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, I, I was... Here's my... And unikernels are not here now, for sure. Yeah, just like IPv6, it's always <laughs> somewhere, <laughs> somewhere in the future. This will I, be the year of the. I this will be the year of the Linux desktop. I, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's another good. Yeah, I worked on uh, a, a project called we called it Tunnel Tunnel 97, and uh, uh, back in 1997, and we were. Uh, um, we were real nervous because IPv6 and uh, IPsec was just about to come, and uh, so here we are, you know, basically 20 years later. On a different still technology. Still not here. And Unikernel's basically, yeah, he's right, because, you know, the Node.js and the Python, the PHP you developed, they're all going to become kernel developers. You know, and uh, we're, uh, but, oh, let me, I, I, I'm getting a little hot. Yeah. Oh, here, so he's prepped, because here comes the shirt. <laughs> so let me get this straight. PHP developers are going to put their apps into it. And, and, and this is such a classic developer thing. Oh, yeah, I can do it. I'm awesome. And then all of a sudden, how many of you guys are out there are sysadmins? Okay. In his world, in the future, when that app doesn't work and doesn't connect to the network, you ain't going to have ping. You ain't going to have systrace. You aren't going to have anything. Anybody that's played with containers, and you go into a container, a micro, you know, little tiny container, the first thing you, say, you get in there and say, uh, let me ping something. Oh, you don't have ping. Oh, let me S-trace something. I don't have S-trace. In this world, you don't even have shell, okay? You have nothing. You don't have fork, okay? We're ignoring the last 40 years of, of software development. You know, so if you just Google for unikernels and their problems right here, you find some great <laughs> articles. <laughs> Unikernels are unfit for production. They're fit for getting your doctorate. <laughs> and now I know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm not sure that, you know, these guys are, you know, you've got to read these articles. They're, they're, it's unbelievable. And then they talk about security. Because, you know, if you look at security of this thing, that, you know, everybody's fearful of remote exploit. In this case, you know, in remote exploit, if I get to uh, execute certain commands, Okay, now I get into the machine and I have to become root. And then somehow I get root and I have to get to, down to the hypervisor. These things start at that level, okay? There is no security separation. There is no SE Linux. There's no process separation. There's no roles. There's nothing. You are friggin' everything in there, okay? So now we have PHP people designing a kernel that is going to be secure. <laughs> okay, okay but wait, now it's my turn. <laughs> I cannot let this atrocity stand. How many of you, when you heard, first heard Docker containers were going to take over the world, said that's bullshit and what a bunch of hype? Come on, Ray, be honest. <laughs> bullshit. I'm calling bullshit on all of you except for the two people who raised your hands. I know Dan, before he actually started working on the Docker project, was probably like, ah, frickin' containers. Yeah, people are going to actually be able to do LXC and C groups and namespaces. Frickin' developers are going to be able to do that. Smoke, roll me another one. So <laughs> what I'm saying is, and I said it clearly, Unikernels are not here now. They are not ready for production use now. I do not advocate that you use them for production now. I do think the OS matters, and I do think if, or is almost everybody here a Red Hat person? Who's not a Red Hat person? Yeah, I'm gonna have to ask you to leave the room now. Um, <laughs> what I'm, I'm actually fighting for the, uh, 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 we adopted containers because we knew that containers were going to be the future, and I think that to just dismiss unikernels as that is some IPv6 thing is foolhardy. <laughs> so wait, time out, I'm not done yet. One last thing. So while the unikernels we have today, if you look at those links that I sent, if anybody took pictures of them, it's not the developer actually building a unikernel. There is a framework like a Docker build, and the syntax is exactly almost the same as a Docker build, where the framework, in the same way that it builds a container, so I don't have to know about C groups and namespaces and all that stuff, the unikernel is being built by the framework. And the, the one part, the reason why I'm most bullish on Unic rather than anything else is it doesn't require me to write in Elixir. It doesn't require me to write in Rust. It's, and 
it already has Kubernetes orchestration. Right, so they're actually taking this seriously. You can actually run uni unikernel applications in Kubernetes at this point. Should you use it in production? No. Should you ignore it and keep it completely off your radar and believe the naysayers? No, at your own peril, shall I say. <laughs> okay, so he's been flashing up my last screen, which is you know, these friggin' kids. <laughs> they come along and they just ignore the senior older engineers telling them, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So frankly, just get off my lawn. <laughs> okay, so the other thing that I will say is the younger generation, no it's not. As the under, younger, younger generation, you should let go of the biases of the old people who said this cannot be done, and perhaps embrace the new now that we live in a new world. All right, we're going to pick the winner here by a round of applause. Let's oh, hear an applause. Forget it, I'm just going to sit down. Pro Unicernal, let's hear it. Dan's gonna win. It's about two or three people. And oh, <laughs> ain't even a bias. For, you sit next to Dan. How can you non, be the impartial judge? And the, the You're non, like the electoral college. The non unicernal. Let's hear it. Oh! Oh! I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut the demo. We're gonna, yeah, uh, it's fine. All right. So I guess we've got like a few minutes here before we get started on our final day, day three of DevConf. We've got a few questions. He had his hand up even before we got to the, I think I've got a question slide. Hey, we're the container crew. Yeah, so let's hear, let's hear it, Adam, and I will repeat the question. I have, I have a question for uh, Steve. How mm -mm. do you actually run Unicorns? Like, what is the execution environment? How do you plan to run Unicorns? What, what, so is, what is the execution environment? Again, I'm not an expert, because I'm not a kernel engineer. So if, you would, if, if the way that this was to run was you had to actually be a kernel engineer, or you had to write in Elixir or some foreign language that basically is on a fringe for now, and probably forever, and that would have got, saying Elixir was a fringe language and forever, I'm glad I'm, this is not Linux Conf Australia. Um, what the idea is, I don't, I, it's like Docker to me. Docker to me is magic, right. not really, right? So w if I can do unikernel run, like Unic run this unikernel I built, great. And then if I can give it to Kubernetes to orchestrate it, even better. And I'm gonna trust people, engineers who are old, and have arcane wisdom yeah. to actually <laughs> believe yeah. that they did their job right to get that done. Right, it's tough to get a word in edgewise. The way you the run. The question was the to way me. The, the, way, <laughs> the way you, uh, well, I'm going to answer them. Why? Yeah, you don't you, have you, to. <laughs> yeah. You run them under KVM. They're basically, yeah, they're, they're, they're they're basically they're like. You need a hypervisor. So you just turn the hypervisor into your. Right, the hypervisor ends so up being. So how do most people hypervisor, run containers? Ends up, hypervisor ends up being a single process. That's usually in a hypervisor. How many of you here run containers on bare metal? Yeah, four. Yeah, oh, Adam. Oh, you're such a, you're such a typical use case. I'm the Fedora release engineer. That is not a typical use case, my friend. All right, next question. Next, next question. question. Again, haters. No. What's, so what's the out. question? The, the question was, it was a comment really, picking on the name Unic. Well, so time out. Oh, you it's an EMC project. I don't even, I'm not, a, okay, I will tell the, the, hey, EMC, if you're watching the video, what's your name again? Unique. Clint? Cl you're mispronouncing it. Okay, so I'm mispronouncing it. <laughs> Okay, so okay. actually, EMC, you're great, but the, w the spelling that you did does not lead to correct pronunciation. We need, we need two E's. Okay, we because got it's time Unix, for... Unix, not Unix. One more question, one more question. I know, it's fine. Let's go, go for it. All right. Yeah. Mike. Hang on, I'm gonna make you, I'm not gonna repeat this question, mm -hmm. you gotta ask it again. So there's a project called HalVM, it's a Haskell um, unikernel. And people are using it in production to create transparent virtual network interfaces that sit between the kernel and the actual network devices. And this is to do like uh, man in the middle type um, interactions where they can watch even TLS traffic and they can inspect it before it gets to the actual like virtual machine client. Can I do that with a container?
Yeah, I, I, <laughs> you can do anything, you can do on an operating system with a container, so, yeah. Yeah, well, f first of all, uh, Paul, Paul Moore had a talk the other day, and he called uh, um, containers is like Santa Claus, in that you know wherever you go in the world, someone has a different definition of a Santa Claus. Um, a, a container is just a process with some kernel stuff done to it. Okay, it's just it's just tile. Just and in a lot of cases, it's it's nothing more than a cheroot. So it, there is no real definition of a container, but a container is a process on the system. If you're given enough privileges, it can do anything, any process, you know, any root process can do on the system. So yeah, yeah a container process can do anything uh, that a process can do. All right. So I think we're at time, guys. I would thank you very much. I want to remind everybody the final session of the day is always very fun. Please make your way back here. And since it's the final day, if you have a moment and you see some volunteers, make sure to thank them. They've done a very good job. So, yeah, thanks uh, to everybody that put it together. <laughs> And one another reminder, do not forget to post your feedback and rating for this session.